Hey friends, my name is Joshua Halando On. I am a pastor here on staff at City Church. Um, I'm delighted. It's always a privilege to be able to preach and to uh, open up God's Word and see what um, the Spirit wants to say to us uh, this morning. Um, I'm, so, I'm really thankful that you're here. Thanks for being here. Uh, why don't you pray with me? And then I'm going to attempt to speak on this doozy of a passage. Uh, and then at the end, you'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not this was a successful attempt. Yeah. So, All right, pray with me. God, we are uh, filled with expectation as to what you want to say for us this morning, uh, whether or not we realize that or not, whether or not we've stumbled into this room, into this space, or whether we are here um, purposefully. Uh, our hearts long to hear a word uh, from you. And so we ask uh, God of our ancestors that you would speak powerfully in this space and that the, the one voice that would be heard uh, would be yours. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the late actor Alan Rickman has this mantra that all great acting is listening. I recently came across this interview where Rickman was being uh, pressed on what this mantra means. And uh, the interviewer said most people would actually find that mantra strange because most people think that actors are judged on what they say, not how they listen. And Rickman responded, well, you only speak when you wish to respond to something that you've heard. What you have to say is completely incidental. All I want to see from an actor is the intensity and accuracy of their listening. And then what you have to say will become automatic. And then it will be free and alive. But the basic engine is how accurate is your listening? And how alive are you to your fellow actors? And how accurate is your response? As I prepared for this passage, listening uh, became a, a common theme that I saw central to the passage. Just as we often don't associate acting with listening, we often don't associate uh, the story of Babel with listening. And uh, this theme became especially important um, as we talk and speak about what it means to have an intelligent faith in the world of AI, in the age of AI, in a time where it becomes increasingly difficult to hear one another. So for those of us who are familiar with the story, we've often uh, seen the story interpreted as uh, the birth of human languages. The story has been interpreted as a warning against human pride. The human builders undertake an ambitious project to construct a tower, and God punishes them for their pride by confusing their languages. We often associate the story of Babel with human speech, but perhaps it has more to do with the failure of the human builders to listen and to respond to God well. Humans do speak in the passage, but it reveals a failure to respond to what God is doing in the world. And so we're going to try to do a little experiment this morning. Uh, we're going to listen to the passage in three different ways. I'm going to point three, out, three different things out. The first way is uh, we're going to listen to the words of the builders themselves. And we're also going to listen to uh, what the inanimate objects, the building materials, have to say to us in this story. And at the end, we're going to listen to what God says and what God does in response to the builders. And so let's take that one by one. Uh, humans in this passage represent all the nations of the world, and they speak twice in this passage. The first time they speak, uh, they construct a plan that leads to the inception of a, a new technology, brick making. Wonderful. With this new power at their disposal, we might anticipate the humans are going to try something new. 
that they have this opportunity to respond to what God is doing in the world in a different way, something that is never done before, to say something different. But their words betray them because the second time they speak, they announce their plans for this new technology to build what has always been done, what has already been done, to build a city, to build a tower, and to make their own names great. We should recognize their words in this passage as reminiscent of the ancestors in the previous chapters of Genesis. Cain and his descendants build great cities, great civilizations that breed violence and injustice in the world. So instead of birthing something new into the world, they resort to doing the thing that has always been done. They resort to the actions of their forebearers and they use their technology for their own self-preservation and fortress building. And it seems like what they're responding to in the passage is not what God has to say to them, not the voice of God, but their own fear. It's not even their ambition. It's their fear. The tower is a defensive structure. It is a place of refuge where people can retreat to in security and safety. And so their aspirations here Betray them because they are a failure to envision the future that God has for humanity. The humans in the passage are content to live in the world as it is and not the world that can be. But that's not the purpose of language. If we look at the words that are chosen in the passage, that are spoken by the builders, the purpose of language is... is not just to describe the world as it is, but to help us envision the world that we long for. Language can help describe the history of our world. It can help us understand the state of our world. But there's another purpose to language, the purpose that is being pointed to in this text, that the purpose to language is to help us tell a better story about our worlds. That is also what his language is for. Language is meant to open up the world, to pull us outside of ourselves. And that is the reason why the, the work of poets and artists are so crucial to the work that we do here. Because artists and poets use words to inspire us, to awaken wonder in us. Words are important in Genesis. In the creation narratives, Yahweh speaks and creates merely through his words. Brings order and life from words. And God attributes the same quality of co-creation to humans. Adam's task of naming the animals is not this cute exercise of naming armadillos and penguins. It's this act of Naming something that brings meaning into the world, that speaks meaning into existence. The Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann writes, language need not be only descriptive of what is. It can be evocative and creative, calling into being the things that do not exist. Such language is the way of promise and hope. Perhaps we've forgotten the purpose of this kind of language because we often reduce language to describe the world as it is rather than the world that should be. Perhaps this is the primary use of language, not merely to describe the world that we see, but the world that we want to see. And the words of the human builders betray, as the words of the human builders betray their inability to respond to God's movement, so does their technology. So their technology doesn't speak, doesn't have words in the passage, but there are different ways in which scholars believe that the writers are trying to tell us something about the building materials themselves. There are several instances where the text hints at the defectiveness of these building materials. 
So the bonding agent that's used in the passage, um, not the bricks themselves, the bonding agents often tra- translated tar. Uh, in the CAB translation, was translated asphalt. Um, this bonding agent is, seems by scholars to be quite primitive. This is the same bonding agent that is used uh, in Exodus when Moses' uh, mother uh, puts together the basket that she puts him in and sends him off in the river. That's the same bonding agent there. And it contrasts, this bonding agent contrasts with the cement that the Israelites used to build bricks for Pharaoh's buildings. And so what does that mean for us? Why did I just give you that uh, history lesson? Even if you have strong bricks, without the bonding agent, uh, your building is is not secure. It's going to fall apart. And so that's really important because the text is emphasizing something to us about the builder's project, that the building materials themselves, the very tools themselves, point to our own defectiveness, point to our own deficiencies. If we look to our technologies to tell us something about ourselves, we might find that they're saying something, they're becoming, acting like a mirror, or prophesying about who we are as humans and where we are falling short. So take, for example, criminal risk assessments. Uh, Criminal risk assessment tools or algorithms decide to reduce recidivism, the tendency of a convicted criminal to reoffend. And with the rates of incarceration being so high, lawmakers and law enforcement agencies are under immense pressure to move defenders through a legal system as safely and as efficiently as possible. And to do so, they've turned to these automated tools, risk assessment tools, to estimate the likelihood of repeat offenders. So here, and here's how it works. Risk assessment algorithms take into account a defender's uh, record, and they spit out a score that will grade whether or not this person is ready to reenter society and will reoffend or not. And so, This score determines that all all sorts of things. It determines whether or not uh, rehabilitation services, uh, the rehabilitation services that these particular defendants receive, they determine whether or not these defendants would be held in jail before trial. They determine how severe their sentences are. But here's the issue with these tools, is that even though a case can be made for why these tools are necessary, the problem is that these tools in themselves are driven by algorithms that are trained on historic crime data, which has an extreme bias towards low-income communities and minority ethnic communities. And that's ironic because the very algorithm that is supposed to promote justice is defective. The very tools that we rely on are not are undermining the things that they're supposed to do. And so I don't mean to be alarmist about AI. I don't think that AR itself is inherently harmful. It's the human inputs, right? And so I'm really interested in the question, what is AI trying to show us about ourselves? What, is the, what are the tools themselves trying to show us about who we are as humans and how far we have to go? Notice the text isn't assigned blame to the technologies. In the text, it sees uh, the technology of brick making as a natural outgrowth of human ingenuity and agency. But the text invites us to listen to what the technology is showing us about ourselves, to listen to how it is shaping us. And in the passage, the technologies prophetically speak about the builders, namely their inability to listen. It's ironic in the passage that the builders can hear the voice of God, but do not listen to God. Their project is in direct violation to God's command to fill the earth with vast, a vast diversity of cultures 
and peoples and societies. So these builders can hear, but they choose not to listen. In the same way, perhaps they can hear one another, but are unable to listen to one another. When we hear the one voice that speaks from the people, we should be skeptical. Because what they've achieved here is not this unity by consensus. It's a unity by what an Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann, calls oppressive conformity. A false unity that is unwilling to recognize and embrace cultural difference. The monocultural identity of the humans should be called into question here and should be seen as resistant to God's command for humans to fill the earth. And this is why the confusion that God brings should be seen as a grace. As a grace to these humans and not as a means of judgment. Or perhaps it is just as much a grace as it is judgment. Because the disruption that God brings about in the passage into the people's situation here is that they're forced to listen to one another. Maybe not right away, but God forces them into a moment where they must learn how to listen to God and to one another anew. Are we able to see confusion as grace? So in 2014, uh, Melody and I uh, were saving money to move uh, to California, uh, where I would attend grad school. And uh, we moved in with my in-laws, who were, were kind, of us, kind enough to take us in at the time. And uh, at the time, uh, Melody's grandmother uh, lived uh, with us, and uh, Spanish was her first language. Uh, Abuelita lived on uh, the first floor um, of a three-story house uh, right next to the kitchen. And so it was uh, very difficult to avoid Abuelita whenever I had, like, the munchies. Uh, uh, and so I was, I was forced to practice, you know, my, like, really broken Spanish uh, with her. Uh, she would make me uh, mate, which is uh, Argentinian tea. Um, and uh, I, I would sit with her and... Uh, try to have conversations for as long as I could until it got awkward uh, for the both of us. Um, and then uh, we just kind of knew that we were done. We were like, right. and we split. <laughs> There's a kind of beauty that comes after trying to speak a language that isn't yours. When you're trying to have a conversation uh, with someone and you can't speak their language very well, you're forced to slow down you don't have enough words to begin with. So you have to slow down. And you have to pay attention to their words. And I'm not just talking about those, the words that come out of their mouth. I'm talking about body language. I'm talking about facial expressions. And I'm not saying that when I had conversations with Abuelita, that I did that perfectly, and I regret that I didn't have them often, as often as I wish I did. But I am saying that looking back, this was something something that I felt was an obligation was actually more of a grace to me. And this grace was certainly not anything that I said or was said to me, but the opportunity to listen. Can we see confusion as grace? I think so. The confusion that God brings about in the passage is not a confusion that is meant to last forever. Yahweh brings the people into this season of listening so that something new can emerge. So when we think about the kind of future that we want to have here at City Church, listening is crucial to what we are about. In the age of AI, as the world gets increasingly more polarized, as the truth becomes very hard to distinguish, as it becomes easier to retreat into distraction and our own echo chambers, what does it mean for us to learn how to listen again 
And here I'm speaking specifically to many of us here who enjoy a great deal of privilege. The spiritual practice that you and I need to hone in this season of our lives is the spiritual discipline of listening. Listening well. I know that that is easier said than done. I am guilty of not listening just as much as the next person. And that's why it takes a community of people coming together, willing to listen to one another well. It's not forever. In the Gospel of Luke, the priest Zachariah was made mute by the angel of God. And then God allows Zechariah to prophesy at the birth of his son. So maybe we enter into the season of listening in order that we might learn to speak again. Maybe we might enter into the season of listening so that we might learn how to exercise our prophetic voice and evoke wonder and imagination and new life in our community and our city. And so may we be that community that learns how to listen in order to speak again. May we learn to invite the disruption of the Spirit as a grace. May we embrace the confusion of the wild spirit who brings new speech and new hearing and new understanding. In the days ahead, may you be a people who are slow to speak, and quick to listen to each other and to God. In the name of Jesus.